Hello everyone, I'm Remy Remsleep and welcome to my show where I make a Mother One Iceberg video and you sit there and watch. Before we get started, I'd first of all like to thank fellow Discord user, Redditor, and YouTuber Kaj, as well as my friend Alfie for helping me work on this video script for the Underground and Crystal Caverns portion of this video. I thought I could do it all myself, but my personal life started getting into the way, so I seeked help where help was needed and it certainly paid off, so thank you both very, very much. Secondly, I'd like to thank the following animators for allowing me to show off some of their work in this video, Hannah Phantoms, Tanner Creative, and others I will mention later in the video. Lastly, I'd like to mention that I will be using some clips from the Mother to Earth documentary throughout this video, which is indeed copywritten material. It is deemed fair use as long as I use these clips solely for commentary purposes, and an iceberg video would count as such. I hope, anyway. <laughs> if I have to make changes, I will. Anyway, let's begin. Hello, 3DS, and welcome to Let's Play Earthbound Zero! How awesome is that? Alright, let's get going. Oh no! It's a ghost! And it's happy. Let's go ahead and fight it. It's a ghost. He's happy. Let's go ahead and fight it. I said those barbaric words all the way back in 2012, and here I am still talking about this game. Earthbound Beginnings is to me personally the Superman ice cream of the NES, right up there with my top two Mario titles and the original Final Fantasy. I fondly remember playing Mother all the way back in my third grade computer class, showing it to my friends and eventually completing it around that time. It was such a long time ago, but since then I've played the game several more times and was always intensely curious about its history. This has inspired me to create an iceberg for Mother 1, which if you aren't familiar, an iceberg is a chart that categorizes information from most commonly known to least common, though that may vary depending on the iceberg. So with this year's Mother Direct happening, Earthbound Beginnings finally getting released on the Switch, and a lot of peer pressure, I have come to the conclusion that now is no better time to make a video on this topic. It's chock full of weird facts, references, and fan theories, because what kind of iceberg doesn't have those lovely abominations? So without further ado, this is the ultimate Mother One Iceberg. Precursor to Earthbound, Mother 2. If someone has ever recommended a Mother game to you, it would most likely be this one. Earthbound is like the more popular middle child of the series, probably since it was the only one out of the bunch that actually released on its intended console, but more on that later. Goes under various titles. If you aren't familiar with the Mother series at all, and I'm wondering why I'm talking about Mother 1 and Earthbound Beginnings like it's the same thing, that's because, well, it is. Mother 1 is the Japanese version, while Earthbound Beginnings is the English version. But that's not all. The English version was originally going to be titled Earthbound, but since that didn't happen, it was unofficially named Earthbound Zero, since, well, there can't be two Earthbounds. Then finally, the name was officially changed, again, to Earthbound Beginnings. And luckily for us, it stayed that way. The Franklin Badge. The Franklin Badge is an item that can be used to deflect certain PSI powers back to their caster. According to the game's lore, it has been said that the badge was once worn by Benjamin Franklin himself. If he wore one, then why are there two of them? Maybe he just needed one for each pack. And yes, you heard me correctly, Earthbound Beginnings is the only game in the series that has more than one Franklin badge in it. Earthbound Beginnings Uno, Earthbound Zero. The Franklin badge is also an item in the Super Smash Bros. series. Shigastro Toy did a really good job on animating this game. I mean, I'm really happy for that guy. Shikasato Itoi is the creator of the Mother series. For Mother 1 specifically, he was the director, writer, and lead designer. Thematic and visual similarities to Earthbound, Mother 2. Earthbound and Earthbound Beginnings are both very similar in many ways. They both use the same character stereotypes with slightly different designs. In both games, you're tasked to collect eight melodies while your little sister stores your items for you, and you have to call your dad if you ever want to save your game. I can go on and on, but so can this iceberg, so let's proceed. Game footage seen in Magic Cant stage. In the background of the Magic Cant stage in Super Smash Bros. 4 and Ultimate, you can see footage of Earthbound beginnings through a tear in the sky. Mother One Spirits. While on the topic of Super Smash Bros., there are quite a few Mother Spirits you can collect. 
Ninten, of course, ranking the highest in the legendary class. Cancelled English localization despite being finished. Remember when I said in the beginning of this iceberg that Earthbound was the only mother game that released on its intended console? Well, we could have had Earthbound beginnings too, since Nintendo of America was planning okay. to localize the game. But despite the game being finished, Earthbound Beginnings American release was cancelled due to the upcoming Super Nintendo. Officially released in the US only on Nintendo Wii U and Switch. After 25 years of neglect, Earthbound Beginnings has finally received a redemption arc, being released on the Wii U Virtual Console and eventually would come to Switch. Notorious Enemy Encounter Rate If there is one solid reason to spite Earthbound Beginnings, it is definitely this. The encounter rate in any RPG depends on how often you engage in battles. In Earthbound Beginnings specifically, without getting too technical, the enemy encounter rate is stupendously high all throughout. Battling enemies takes up a grand majority of the game, and sometimes battles will occur spontaneously right after you come out of one, which is the best feeling in the world, I might add. My reason for putting this so high up on the iceberg is because this is one of Earthbound Beginning's most infamous criticisms, and it's obvious to anyone who plays it. Unfortunately, this is among the many reasons why some gamers would rather just skip it entirely. Clay Models If you're looking at the Switch cover and wondering what this ominous creature standing in the black void is, it's a clay model. And despite what the Switch cover wants you to think, there are a lot of them. There were clay models made for landscapes, good guys, bad guys, and Pippi! Hey, looking pretty good there! We should put her on the Switch cover, that would be perfect. But in all seriousness, I love the look of all of these, so much so that I bought the replicas. I assume that these clay models were made for advertising purposes, as well as for the game's sprite work, considering how similar they both look in comparison. Ape Inc. Ape Incorporated was a company created in 1989 by Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi. The purpose of the company was to potentially recruit outside talent into the gaming industry. Why is this relevant? Well, Itoi was acquainted CEO of this company by Yamauchi, and the very first game they ever worked on was Mother. Censorship in the English release. The majority of Earthbound Beginnings cut content is still present in its Japanese counterpart. Blood, cigarettes, knives, references to religion, altering the dialogue to sound less dark and scary, etc. The towns in the Japanese version were originally named after holidays. This would also eventually be changed due to Sanhop's distaste for the idea, who I will talk about shortly. Twinkle Elementary School was originally, most likely accidentally, titled Tinkle Elementary School, which I thought was kind of funny. PSI Powers. PSI, which is short for Psionic is the magic system of the Mother series, as opposed to traditional mana and sorcery. According to Etoy, PSI in the Mother universe is a part of everyone. It's only a matter of awakening that power to be able to start learning the various abilities associated with it. In Mother 1, Anna is the PSI juggernaut of the game, while Ninten uses PSI more on the sidelines, possessing more support and assist PSI abilities. Between the both of them, there are 45 PSI powers in total, with many of them just being more powerful versions of others. Unlike Ninten, Anna possesses more defensive and offensive PSI abilities, most likely to compensate for having the literal worst attack power in the entire Mother series. And no, that is not a joke. Visual similarities to Peanuts It has been said that the character sprites in Earthbound Beginnings bear a bit of a resemblance to the characters from the Peanuts comics. So much so that some overworld sprites had to be redesigned to avoid their likeness. It isn't clear if Peanuts actually influenced Mother in any way, but there is a lot of fan art online. Mother title based on John Lennon's song. Now I'm certain there were other influences behind the game's title, but Etoy himself has gone on record saying that he was greatly influenced by John Lennon's song Mother for the game's title. The song made Etoy feel an emotion that he wanted players of his game to feel, and even though Etoy looks at Mother 1 like more of an experimental version of its sequel, whatever exact feeling he had that day was quite possibly enough to set the tone for the rest of the series. Catherine Warwick If you believe the morning sun, chances are you have heard the voice of this singer. At the age of 14, London native Catherine Warwick was one of the main singers in the official Mother Music album. Didn't think an 8-bit RPG could have an official music album now, did ya? She performed as lead vocalist particularly in Pollyanna, Wisdom of the World, and Being Friends. Unfortunately, her career success wouldn't peak any higher after this point, but if you ever feel down and about, you can always come back and listen to the various reasons of why Catherine Warwick believed in you. George and Maria. If you don't know the basic plot of Earthbound Beginnings, allow me to explain the relevance of George and Maria. George and Maria are Nintendo's great-grandparents. One day, they both mysteriously vanish from the face of the Earth, with only one of them returning.
morning while the other, being Maria, was never seen again. Nearly a century later, it's up to Ninten with the help of his great-grandfather's diary to solve the case. And who knows, perhaps someday he may even save the world. Uh, I wish that show would make a comeback. Mother 1 is the only mother game that didn't risk cancellation. It's true, even though it was rushed towards the end. All things considered, however, Mother's development cycle was pretty short, spanning from only 1987 to 1989. In comparison to its brothers from another mother, one of them almost being dropped after five years while the other's development being so bad it started hanging out in Duke Nukem Forever's Treehouse of Development Hell, it's easy to see that Mother 1 had something good going for it. Mother 1's soundtrack. Writing the soundtrack for Mother 1 was no easy task, but with the collaborative effort between Moonwriter's musician Keiichi Suzuki and Nintendo composer Hirokazu Tanaka, it could be done. In the end, they were both really fond of the game's soundtrack and ended up creating an official album as I mentioned earlier. Interestingly enough, however, in 2021, they both reunited to create a reimagining of the original 1989 album they both worked on nearly 34 years ago. Man, that must have been a huge nostalgia trip for them. Lyrics are in English. Considering the fact that Mother One was a Japan exclusive for many years, it's weird to think that its album was sung entirely in English. This may be due to the game's setting, or that Nintendo tried to pull off another Star Tropics in attempts to appeal more towards a Western audience. However, that's only speculation. 1989 Commercial Imagine being a small little baby boy standing alongside your best friends for eternity at the base of an intimidating geological nightmare. When all of a sudden, if you look real closely, you may just make out what appears to be a MASSIVE ROBOT standing right in front of you, probably pissed off that he had to come all the way over here just to kill you, until you unleash your chat stash and utterly defeat the bastard, only to continue onward into the dark and dangerous. That was the entire Mother 1 1989 commercial in a nutshell, and it is undoubtedly the most famous piece of advertising associated with the game, even coining the game's powerful slogan, Ending made nai. Lloyd or Lloyd? One topic that has been under much debate in the Mother community is which version of Lloyd's name is the right one. In the Japanese version, Lloyd's name is Royd, which comes from the word Royd Omegane, which means thick round glasses in Japanese. Some people assume that Lloyd with an I is the better version of his name since it more closely resembles his name from the original Japanese version. Coincidentally, however, Lloyd with the double L's and a Y actually means gray in Welsh, and gray just so happens to be the color of this little weakling's hair. Additionally, this part particular name has been seen in both trailers for Earthbound Beginning's official release on the Wii U and Switch, which I assume confirms that Lloyd with the double L's and a Y is indeed his official name, at least outside of Japan. But really, is the game going to be mad at you if you decide to name Lloyd with an I? Being an RPG and all, probably not. Etoy never designed a game before Mother. It's true, going into game development was very new for Etoy since he formerly worked in advertising. In fact, Etoy didn't even know how to use a computer. Therefore, he said the entire game's dialogue out loud to programmers, occasionally word for word. The most fascinating part about this process is that Etoy would judge how good the dialogue was based on their reactions to it. If he ever said anything that made them laugh, cry, or feel some other powerful emotion, he would put it into the game. Now that's psychology. <laughs> My reason for putting this on the iceberg is to show that you don't have to know everything in order to create your own stroke of genius. Etoy was approaching his 40s when working on Mother 1, and despite his age and all of his experiences, even he had to start from the bottom when it came to this new venture of his. But with a willingness to work hard, a strong gust of passion, and many people to support his idea, this outsider looking in ended up creating something incredible. Mother 1 plus 2 Easy Ring Hack is the most recommended way to play Mother 1. Remember when I was talking about Earthbound Beginnings enemy encounter rate earlier and why it's stinky poo poo garbage? Well, I have to be honest with you at this point in the video that there have been a lot of hacks to fix this problem, among other things. One of these attempts is called the Mother 1 plus 2 Easy Ring hack in which Ninten can equip an item called an Easy Ring to decrease enemy encounters. Pretty simple. However, one thing that sets itself apart from other ROM hacks is that the translation for this one is as accurate to the original Japanese dialogue as possible. And since Mother 1 Plus 2 was never planned to be localized, nothing ever got cut from the original version. So it's essentially like playing an English version of Mother 1 rather than just playing Earthbound Beginnings. Minus the good sound quality, of course. There's a, that, there's the real drawback. <laughs> Dragon Quest Influence Whenever Etoy laid down in his bed, he would start <laughs> coughing uncontrollably due to his asthma. So while sitting up in his bed, he would either distract himself 
yourself by reading a book or playing video games. Dragon Quest was a game that he didn't expect too highly of in the beginning, but would eventually come to enjoy it as he kept playing. In an interview, he stated that the game made him question the traditional elements of RPGs and what he would do if he was ever in charge of making one of his own. He may have not known it at the time, but eventually his wild ideas would gain the interest of Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario and many others. And from that point onward, the rest was history. Phil Sandhop. Remember that guy I briefly mentioned earlier? Well, we're going straight back to him, since he's pretty important in Mother One's history, and we probably wouldn't even have an Earthbound Beginnings if it wasn't for him. Though wearing many hats while working at Nintendo, Phil Sanhop originally joined the company as a game counselor in the late 80s. Interestingly enough, after playing a crap ton of Final Fantasy on the Famicom, he became so familiar with the game that he was offered the opportunity to localize it for the Western market. Shortly after he completed this project, he would become the localization producer for, you guessed it, Mother One which he was tasked to complete in six months. Great. Some grammatical imperfections were the product of this crunch, but thankfully at least the game was completed just in time to huh. be cancelled. On a side note, Nintendo of America didn't really see the appeal of the game's original title, so Sandhop and crew were tasked to change it, eventually coming up with the name we all know, Earthbound. I asked him, you know, I said, hey Tony, what about Earthbound? Kind of liked it, kind of grew on him. Neo Demiforce Hack Before 1998, the only way you could play Earthbound Beginnings at any capacity was if you were one of the lucky few to own a prototype cartridge, which if you can imagine, there weren't very many of and were often exchanged at a heavy price tag. You know, being a prototype and all. However, that all changed when a 17-year-old by the name of Steve Demeter, leader of a translation group called Neo Demiforce, managed to get into contact with a prototype owner in hopes of dumping the game's content online for everyone to play. They would eventually succeed in doing this, not before making some minor changes of their own, such as fixing some of the game's grammatical errors and spawning the unofficial title that would be tied to the game for the following 16 years. That title being Earthbound Zero, Mother to Earth Documentary. If you like Earthbound Beginnings like I do, or just want to know what the hell's going on here, then I recommend you checking out Mother to Earth, which is a 1 hour and 36 minute long documentary detailing how Mother became Earthbound and how Earthbound became Earthbound Zero. The focus of the film is on tracking down the game's various prototypes and along the way conducting interviews with the likes of Phil Sanhop, Steve Demeter, Keiji Suzuki, and many others you will most likely not see on this iceberg. That being said, if you want to check out this documentary, definitely support these guys and get yourself a copy or go check it out on Vimeo. It's a must-see if you're an Earthbound Beginnings fan. Mother One slash Earthbound Beginnings in a nutshell videos. This is talking about a couple of videos on YouTube that summarize the entirety of Mother One's story with the use of stock images and memes. Other than that, there's not much else to say about them, but I do encourage you to go see them for yourself. You'll be in for a real treat. Mother 25th Anniversary Edition. Though I personally never had any intolerance towards the game's visual appeal, some people may prefer the look of the Mother 25th Anniversary Edition, which is a hack of the original game that contains redesigned sprite work, command menus, and even map layouts to a certain extent. Much like the Easy Ring hack, the enemy encounter rated in this one is also not as excessive. However, I did find it to be a little too easy at times, but difficulty can be subjective. The sprites were redesigned to closely resemble that of the clay models, and new fonts were added into the game too, which was definitely a nice touch. There's also another version of this ROM hack for those who prefer the original character sprites over the newer ones, creatively titled the Vanilla Sprites Patch. One final thing to note about the 25th Anniversary Edition is that it uses the same translation that was seen in the Easy Ring hack. This very translation, originally being created by... Clyde Mandolin, Tomato. Saying that this guy has contributed a lot to the Mother series would be a massive understatement. Being a professional Japanese to English translator, Clyde Mandolin did indeed work on the incredibly faithful translation for the Mother 1 Plus 2 Easy Ring hack. But that's not all he did. As a matter of fact, he's better known for working on the Mother 3 fan translation released back in 2008 and for writing the Legends of Localization's book series. This next tidbit is a bit off topic, but apparently he also works at Funimation, which makes a lot of sense. Those two things go together like peanut butter and jelly, or in this case, tomato and jelly. Mother Remake While on the subject of Clyde Mandolin, he started a project back in 2007 for the purpose of recreating Mother 1 using Mother 2's gaming engine. However, at some point he dropped out of this venture, leaving fellow Mother fans to pick up where he left off. 
And that's about it. Information on this remake is second to none, and the only gameplay footage we have of it is from well over a decade ago. So I think it's safe to say, as much as it's unfortunate to say, that we won't be seeing anything from this project anytime soon. Mother Encore. Mother Encore is an upcoming fan reimagining of Mother One created using the Godot gaming engine. Do keep in mind, however, according to its developers, it's not going to present the exact same experience as the original game. Some notable changes will be made, such as sacrificing the game's non-linearity in order to improve the story and altering some elements to fit more in line with the other games of the series. As of right now, we don't have much else to go off of other than some gameplay and music. Despite this, the game itself looks very promising as well as its development, but drama did ensue among a particular staff member a while back, resulting in him committing multiple social media hijackings and writing nearly 400 pages worth of complaints. Wow. Believe it or not, similar situations like this aren't uncommon when it comes to working on a team, especially if the only one incentive is for the love of what you're creating and nothing else. Mother 4's development history being just one example of this, actually. No, not that, Mother 4. That's better. So let's hope that Mother Encore's development doesn't run into any more problems and that everyone involved can maintain healthy relations because what they have going on here looks pretty remarkable. Mother One Map. If you think this little goofball is the map like he says he is, then Mother One's map should be called the Atlantic Ocean because holy crap, it's big. That's me. One thing that I absolutely appreciate out of Mother One's map is how large in scale everything is in comparison to you. Unlike the overworld map for games like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest where you're basically a giant walking around in a tiny landscape, Mother One's map feels incredibly proportionate to your character and it all feels like one big piece rather than just being cut up into several pieces. Unfortunately this expansive map doesn't provide you too many reasons to explore it with little to no content aside from the main story and a couple of side missions here and there. Though I wouldn't say that for places like the Duncan's Factory which have little gift boxes hidden all throughout the area for you to collect items from. However, due to the location's sheer size and complexity, it's often considered a stopping point for some players. To me personally, I've always enjoyed running around in Mother One's map since it never feels as restrictive as the other games in the series. Like, legitimately, if someone can make a ROM hack where you can just run around freely throughout the entire map for the sake of exploration, that would be awesome. I would be down for that. Mother One Run Feature So in the original Japanese version, there wasn't any sort of run feature present in the game, at least not until Phil Sandhop put one in for the English version. Well, kind of. It's more of a fast forward button since it speeds up not only you, but NPCs and cutscenes simultaneously. A proper run feature wouldn't be implemented until the Mother 1 Plus 2 version of the game, but in all honesty, I think they both work just fine. This leaves Mother 2, or Earthbound, to be the only Mother game that doesn't have a run feature in any of its official releases, unless you count the skip sandwich. Super Mario Bros. 7 In Twinkle Elementary School, you can talk to a student who will ask you if you have ever played Super Mario Bros. 7 before, which I'm certain you never had unless your uncle works at Nintendo, then I'll believe you. The closest thing we have to Super Mario Bros. 7 anyway is Seven Granddad, and that's not even an actual Mario game. Jokes aside, in the Japanese version, the child will instead ask you if you have ever played the game Dragon Quest 4. The reason why this was changed in the English version is likely due to Nintendo not owning the rights to Dragon Quest, but the fact that it's in Mother 1 must mean that copyright laws work a little differently in Japan, I suppose. I don't know that much about it, go ask your parents or something. Pippi based on Pippi Longstocking. Now this one's a little obvious, but in case you don't know, Pippi Longstocking is a fictional character who first appeared in Swedish children's books throughout the mid-20th century. These books would later be adapted into films that would make their debut around the decade Mother was being worked on. Additionally, in the Japanese version, Pippi will ask you if you think her socks are too short, an obvious reference to Pippi Longstocking's, well, Long Stockings. The Flying Man Tragedy. In Magicant, you can team up with a feathered friend known as a Flying Man who can help you fight in battles. When a Flying Man dies, however, they don't come back like you do, and the game makes that very apparent. When you go back to the Flying Man's house after one of them dies, you'll return to see a tombstone in the front yard set up by the Flying Man's siblings, immortalizing his fighting spirit. From then on, you can recruit the Flying Man's brothers who wish to fight in honor of their fallen sibling, and from there, the cycle repeats itself with more and more tombstones being propped up. This is just one of many examples of Mother's realism, as there are plenty more to discuss the further we go down this iceberg. Yeah, there you oh, go. Yeah. Hank's bat. Yeah. Now we know. Named after Hank Aaron, obviously. Hank's bat, named the Hall of Fame bat in the Japanese version, is the most powerful weapon Nintendo can equip in the game, raising his offense up by 48 points. It's speculated that the weapon was named after Major League Baseball player Hank Aaron, however, that's never been officially confirmed. Saturn Valley is absent. Saturn Valley is a reoccurring location throughout the Mother series inhabited by these small harmless creatures called Mr. Saturns. Unfortunately, this location wouldn't make its first appearance until Mother 2, with Mother 1 being the only game not to have one. This is likely due to Etoy not coming 
up with the idea until the second game, but hey, at least they decided to put one in Mother Encore, so that's pretty cool. Pollyanna had to be rewritten five times due to hardware limitations. One thing to note about the NES is that its musical capabilities are very limited, only being able to play three sounds in one noise. With that in mind, it must have been a real challenge to find the right sound for each song in the game, with the trademark song in the series Pollyanna being among the most complicated to work with. Despite these setbacks, Mother One's music pushed the NES's hardware to the absolute limit, creating its own unique sound unparalleled to other games at the time. 8 Melodies Demo Tracks The 8 Melodies is incredibly important to Earthbound Beginnings' identity, so much so that your main objective throughout the entire game is to collect various pieces of it. While I was doing some research, I found a couple of demo tracks for the song, one of them being shown off in the Mother to Earth documentary, while the other one being uploaded to K.H. Suzuki's MySpace page. Both of the demos are pretty much identical to the final version, but I still encourage you to go check them out anyways. Mountie Toy was not playtested. Mountie Toy's difficulty spike is quite a spectacle. I mean, we get that it's the big bad final level in the game and that it should be hard, but some of the enemies here can give you an absurd amount of damage. So much so that there are even game guides out there that state that there's no shame in running away from these battles. Eventually, Shikasatu Itoi himself shed some light on this, simply saying that there just wasn't enough time to playtest it, likely due to Mother being released not long after this point in development. Nintendo Nana using unknown duo PSI power in commercial. I know that the concept of team attacks exist in other games, just not in the Mother games. In the 1989 commercial, Nintendo Nana charge up a PSI attack together, but it's never really specified what it is since it's not in the actual game. It's assumed to be PK Beam, but that's really all I can say about it. Also, since when was there ever a point in the game where you can defeat a giant robot without the use of a tank, or, well, a giant robot? For sabotaging! If you think I'm being over analytical with this, then you're absolutely right. Maker's Mother Iceberg Video During the production of this video, another YouTuber by the name of Maker thought it would be hilarious to release a Mother 1 Iceberg video before me, and you know what? It's actually pretty good. The video itself is short and sweet, being around 17 minutes long and even containing a couple of topics I didn't even think to include on this iceberg. It's a great video overall, but there are a couple of flaws I like to point out to which the very comment section of that video have beat me to the punch. I thought it was really strange that for the first 5 seconds of the video, the camera zoomed in on this gentleman, referring to him as Shikasatu Itoi, which... We know what he looks like, and uh, that's not him. And then all of a sudden, he starts calling him Shikasanto Itao for the rest of the video. Despite these minor screw-ups, it's a great video overall, and I encourage you to check out his channel since, you know, his whole shtick is making iceberg videos, so if you're into that kind of thing, definitely check him out. A lot of people wonder who that girl is, because seriously, she knows so many things that she should know. She knows about magic ants. Isn't that weird? The Spookane Mystery Girl is by far the most normal character in the entire game, with no theories being made about her whatsoever. Ladies and gentlemen, you just experienced a class ass lie. If you ever get stumped in Earthbound, there's always a guy in each town of the game who will give you hints of what to do next in exchange for money. The equivalent for this in Earthbound Beginnings is strange to say the least. There is a lonely little girl who resides in Spookane, though claiming not to be a resident there, but your assistant, who will give you three hints for the perfectly reasonable price of $1,000 each. I mean, you really could just glance at a game guide for free, but whatever. After talking to her for a little while, she'll then suddenly disappear into thin air with no explanation. Ooh. Now, there are a lot of theories surrounding who or what this girl is. One theory speculating that she is a piece of Queen Mary's consciousness leaking into the world, while another theory suggesting that she's either related to the Hintman in some way or that she's simply some kind of ghost, which would make more sense considering that there is a literal haunted mansion here. Anyway, with that being said, let us continue to submerge even deeper into to this mother one madness. Pollyanna, I believe in you, referring to humanity. Coming to realize this new perspective of Pollyanna has certainly helped me to grow more attached to this game, and I know that I already briefly talked about this song a couple of times, but bear with me. Bear with me. As I stated previously, Pollyanna, occasionally titled Pollyanna I Believe in You, is the trademark song of the entire series, making an appearance in all three mother titles in one form or another. In case you aren't aware, the title of the song itself originates from a popular children's novel released all the way back in the early 20th century. According 
According to fellow YouTuber Mackerel Phones, he believes that the song isn't just based off of the book for its namesake. In fact, in his video, What Does Pollyanna Mean?, he explains that Pollyanna isn't just a character but an ideology. An ideology that he believes was woven within the fabric of the Mother series. The title character of the book, Pollyanna Witter, is a young 11-year-old girl who is best described as having a naive childlike optimism towards the people around her, even if said people are downright cruel and unforgiving. This type of optimism is known as positivity bias, or in this case, Pollyannaism, an overwhelming belief in the goodness of humankind that can be both insightful and a detriment. The relationship between Mayor Goodman and Nintan is a perfect example of this. When Mayor Goodman starts barking orders at Nintan, you just kinda go with it. Why? Because humanity is worth fighting for, even if it's for this scumbag. It's that very outlook on life that makes these characters who they are and gives them more motivation to save the planet aside from achieving their own personal goals. I really, really encourage you to check out Macrophone's video about this subject, since he does a much better job at explaining it than I do. Ninten is Ness's father. Oh boy. Ladies and gentlemen, pull up your long sleeves and grab a Clorox wipe, because now we're about to start scrubbing the filthy toilet bowl that is fan theories. Now personally I'm not one to dabble in these sort of affairs, but I did want to note this on the iceberg since it's the most common theory associated with Mother 1. I mean it's already difficult enough to tell the difference between the two, so naturally fans assume that they are related in some way. But when it comes to Ninten being Ness's father, there is a major contradiction, that being the short time span between the events of each game. In other words, the probability of Ninten being Ness's dad would be pretty much impossible. On the other hand, there is evidence in Mother 2 supporting the idea that he is his father since Ness originally received his signature red cat from his father. But that could be anybody. There is a much more plausible theory out there, this one being that Ninten and Ness aren't exactly father and son, but instead stepbrothers who share the same father. After all of that time, we thought he was just at work. As theories tend to go, take everything I just explained with a grain of salt, if not the whole salt shaker. Anyway, moving on. Takeshi's Challenge. If you thought that Mother 1 was pretty frustrating and cryptic on its own, then allow me to present to you a potential change of heart. By 1986, the idea of celebrities designing video games was a pretty new concept, and one that was without reluctance and uncertainty. Shigeru Miyamoto himself was already pretty skeptical of this idea in the first place, and his skepticism would only worsen by the existence of Takeshi's Challenge. This is a game that was designed by a Japanese celebrity, Takeshi Kitano, and is widely regarded as being one of the worst video games of all time. This would leave such a bitter taste in the mouth of Miyamoto that he very well could have had a reason not to work with Etoy in order to prevent another video game disaster from happening. Kenesu 3000 In 1998, a man by the name of Reed Young created a popular mother fan site called Starman.net. It was widely considered to be, for decades, a central hub area for mother fans to share their affections for the series across a global scale. This one user on the site we're about to discuss is named Kenesu 3000, otherwise known as Kenneth Locke. According to his profile, he is a hardcore fan of Mother 1 in particular, and has made various contributions over the years regarding his love for the game. For starters, he was among the first to upload scans of the Mother Encyclopedia to the internet, which prior to this, no such resources were readily available. Secondly, he has worked on a substantial amount of Japanese to English translations for both the Mother Encyclopedia, the Mother One novel, and for the even more obscure Mother One manga, all of which I will elaborate more on later. Lastly, one other thing that people know Kenesu 3000 for is for his artwork. Yes, he is also an artist, and a pretty unique one. His distinguished art style can definitely stand out in a crowd, not to mention his commendable eye for small details, which is a great quality for any illustrator. However, it's very easy to notice a certain wonkiness to his style that occasionally makes you want to question his perspective of human anatomy. Aside from all that, the biggest reason why I included Kenesu 3000 on this chart to begin with was because of his 24-page webcomic that goes more in-depth on the already vague prologue of George and Maria. This comic is very well beloved by the Mother community and has already been briefly referenced in a few Earthbound analysis videos on YouTube. Mother 1 Novelization Not every video game narrative gets a novel adaptation, but Mother 1 certainly did. The novel itself was written by Japanese author Kumi Seori and lasts for about 10 chapters, containing 376 pages in total. Unfortunately, the book was only released in Japan, which tends to be the case for anything Mother-related. Oh yeah. Don't be fooled by the original story subtitle on the cover, by the way, because one thing that many people don't know about this novel is that it is very different from the original source material. In fact, the differences between the novel and the game are so vast that you can pretty much consider the novel to be an alternate reality of sorts. Though that isn't necessarily a bad thing, since I'm currently reading through chapter 9 and I've really enjoyed it thus far. I'll talk about what makes the novel so different more in length as the video goes on, so stay tuned. 2001 A Space Odyssey in 
influence. According to Etoy, the various sci-fi elements seen throughout the Mother series took heavy inspiration from the 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey, a film regarded by many as a staple in the sci-fi genre. Gotta learn from the best. Etoy has also stated that the film granted him a deeply rooted love for monkeys, which might explain a couple things. Boku slash Ken. Much like the game he is a part of, Nintendo himself has also gone by various names in the past. Boku being one of these names, which means me or myself in Japanese. To provide some context, the biggest point of Ninten as a character is to personify the player, so it makes sense as to why some Japanese publications would give him this name in the first place. Another name that he went by was Ken, which was specifically used in the novel, but that's not the only difference, I assure you. This final name that Ninten has gone by is pretty weird, honestly. This name being Douglas Holloway, the only one of Nintendo's name changes complete with a last name. This one originates from a Mother One Choose Your Own Adventure book, which did not release outside of Japan. Why am I not surprised by that? Queen Mary singing Cave of the Tail theme. Like I said before, the main objective of Mother One, aside from beating the living shit out of aliens, is to collect eight fragments of a mysterious song as beseeched by the Queen of Magicant. One thing to note about the Mother series is that it isn't just a blend of sci-fi and reality, but also has some fantasy elements with dragons, queens, and bards, all of which are only really relevant here in this strange pink cladded paradise we call Magicant. <gasps> If you decide to leave or enter Magicant for whatever reason, you always have to walk through this dark, narrow cave. The song that plays in this area is known as the Cave of the Tail theme. Some fans have speculated that this isn't just some ordinary spooky cave music, but Queen Mary attempting to sing the A melodies only to fail time and time again. I think that this theory came about because of fans finding some similarities between the two songs, but I'm not entirely sure otherwise. But it is very interesting, I do like this one. The Mother Saga. Ah yes, the classic Mother One fan creation. I've been anxiously waiting to talk about this one. Welcome to Young Town. All our parents got kidnapped by Gaiden. Why are you smiling, man? <laughs> the Mother Saga is a live-action retelling of Mother One created by a small group of fans. The saga was originally uploaded in a series of videos, but in December of 2010, the video's original uploader, PSI Paula 4, compiled all of the parts together into one feature-length film, ranging up to 1 hour, 51 minutes, and 44 seconds. The quality is exactly what you would expect from this era of YouTube, but you can definitely see that these guys really had fun making this, and that's really where the heart is for this film. There's nothing more wholesome than a group of neighborhood buddies coming together to make a movie, and I'm no stranger to this kind of thing either. In Super Smash Bros. Melee, I sound weird. I sound like poopies. I understand the feeling quite well. Our main cast of heroes includes Ninten, played by Super NES 1000, PSI Paula 4 herself as Anna, Jeff Kirby 58 as Lloyd, who is probably my most favorite character. I mean, just look at his interpretation of Lloyd's clay model. If they made this into a refrigerator magnet, they would make so much money. Just saying. And lastly, Death Star 1995 is Teddy. Other more minor characters were usually played by Snake128512, Mama Dad 2, and Amaterasu Dialga. For the sake of this video and curiosity, I got into contact with PSI Paula 4 to ask her what her favorite part of filming the project was, and this is what she had to say. That would be the scene at the beginning of part 9, where the Blah Blah Gang member chases after Nin Tan, Anna, and Lloyd. My brother Jeff Kirby 58 however, was unable to keep up with us running, being way younger than us, so the gang member was only chasing Nin Tan and Anna. The way Lloyd is just left behind as myself and the others run across a busy street in the distance without even looking is hysterical to me. This was the scene that she was referring to. Two things could have happened here. Either your brother legitimately couldn't run fast enough, or he's secretly just the world's greatest actor, and nobody had the slightest idea the whole time. I mean, he did play Lloyd after all, and getting left behind for bigger and better things is second nature to the poor guy. The fun fact about the Mother Saga is that it is the only reenactment of Mother 1 or any Mother game to be completed from start to finish. Well, that's not entirely true, but we'll get to that a little later. Earthbound Beginnings 3D Sen. 3D Sen is an NES emulator that is the first of its kind since it can play NES games in the third dimension. 
In 2016, the creator of 3D Sen, Geode Studio, uploaded some gameplay footage of Earthbound Beginnings running in this emulator. It definitely looks like there is still some optimization left to be done, but it's a work in progress nonetheless. At least that's what we're led to believe, anyway. As it currently stands, this 3D profile is still under development, and there are no plans to release it publicly as of yet. Mathem Draw Mother 1 Remake If you thought that Earthbound Beginnings in 3D Sen was a cool idea, then you might like the look of this underground gem. <laughs> Get it? Because it's the uh, underground tier? Ah, ah, whatever. Anyway, from what I could find out about him online, Mathem Draw is a fellow artist and game developer located in France. Though it doesn't seem to be his most current project, he has worked on his own Mother 1 remake a few years ago using the Unreal Engine 4 gaming engine. This remake has a very Octopath Traveler feel to it, complete with 2D character sprites running around in various 3D environments. And by various, I mean almost all of them. Podunk, Magicant, the Yucca Desert, Mount Etoy, Duncan's Factory, the Rosemary Manor, etc. With the obviously crazy amount of work that has already been put into this, it's a shame that there isn't some kind of playable demo of it, at least not one that I know of. Mother Roots. If you didn't think Mother 1 had enough remakes already, well, here's another one. <laughs> That was close. Now for a second there, I thought that this wasn't going to be a Mother remake. Wouldn't that be terrible? Out of all of the remakes I talked about so far, Mother Roots is probably the most obscure of the bunch for two major reasons. Firstly, the only place where I could find anything about it was through the game's official Twitter page. Secondly, and most importantly, there isn't much content available surrounding the game's development aside from the occasional enemy sprite showcase and a couple of songs. This remake is also relatively new, so that also might be a contributing factor to its obscurity. As for the purpose of Mother Roots, it aims to be as faithful as possible to the original sprite and map designs with additional updated graphics and music. Aside from that, there isn't much else to talk about, but I did begin to realize something while writing this. Mother 1 has received the most remakes out of the entire trilogy, which makes sense considering how different it is from its predecessors. Cerebrum PSI Block Trick Whenever you're running amok through the caves of Mount Etoy, be on the lookout for this little fella, who's known as a Cerebrum. This creature is quite a joy to fight, allow me to elaborate on why that is. Whenever Anna becomes a level 8, she'll learn a new PSI power known as PSI Block, which is a really handy ability and does exactly what you think it does. When in use, this ability prevents an enemy from using any form of PSI power at all, and this ability doesn't wear off either, so once it's activated, it's irreversible. This ability is especially useful against enemies who are heavily dependent on PSI attacks, but very few are quite like the Cerebrum, who can't fight without using PSI. Hmm, you don't say. Just use PSI block on him, and from that point onward, he's basically rendered a joke of a living organism. You can pretty much end the fight right there if you want, or you can get Anna to use PSI Magnet on him and leech off of his PSI points. Who knows, a little extra scratch may save your life down there in those unpredictable caves. Unused enemy sprites. Hidden within the game's data are two unused enemies, the first one being a literal pillow, and the second one is... Pippi. Well, this is awkward. I can imagine that there would have been a brief fight with Pippi after breaking her out of the casket, with her mistaking you for a zombie or something. As for the sentient pillow, what a missed opportunity, man. This enemy could have been iconic for all we know. Hashtag justice for the mother one pillow. Come on, guys, let's make this a thing. Ruler. In the town of Marysville, you can buy a 12-inch ruler. Great! Does it do anything useful? No, it doesn't. Aside from quote-unquote measuring things, which isn't very helpful in its own, this item serves no purpose whatsoever. It can't be used as a weapon, it doesn't help you in battle, and worst of all, you bought this with money. A $22 wand of cash, never to be seen again, all at the cost of your stupidity. So you're probably wondering, why put such an evil item in the game? What is even the point? Well, the ruler is categorized as a gag item, which is more of an interactive set piece than something that can be actually useful. The ruler isn't the only gag item in the game, as you might have guessed, and some of them are pretty fun to win this first hand. For example, in Twinkle Elementary School, you can talk to this guy who will sell you a real rocket. Not a bottle rocket, a full-fledged, fully capable rocket ship for just a little over $3,000. However, the mysterious teacher that you buy it from accidentally sends the rocket into space, therefore being completely useless. But it is good for a laugh, and that's something these gag items do best. Usually I wouldn't prefer to have items like this in any video game, but I do believe that Etoy included the ruler for a reason aside from just a simple joke. But I could be wrong on this. In reality, not every item in your possession is going to live up to the standard of usefulness that you think it might, and it begins to beg the question, is this item really going to be useful to me in the long run? <laughs> Look at me trying to intellectualize the ruler. I think I'm going to move on before I start making an even bigger fool of myself. Let's continue. Pippi and Teddy have identical stats. Teddy may not know how to use PSI like Nintendo or Anna, but he makes up for this with his physical strength, an attribute that is only unique to him even throughout the entire series. He has the highest offense out of any other character, 
which would make sense just by looking at him. But did you know that Pippi also has these same attributes? Though you would never know it since when you first meet her, she is a level 1, unlike Teddy who starts off at a level 18. The fact that she's also a temporary party member doesn't help out either, so you never really get to see her true potential in battle. Ninten was designed after Itoi. Being the only writer on Mother 1, it would make sense that Itoi would put his own life experiences in the game. Write what you know as they say. Some similarities I could find between Itoi and Mother's protagonist is that they both suffer from asthma, have a shared fascination for penguins, and both had an absent father growing up. Aside from that, I couldn't find any other noteworthy similarities, but do let me know in the comment section in case I missed anything. Mother Encyclopedia Travel Guide Likeness Mother 1 is a pretty weird game on its own, but the Mother Encyclopedia is even weirder, and in more ways than you can possibly imagine. Unlike most game guides around this time, the Mother Encyclopedia feels more like a bizarre travel guide. For starters, it contains real-life photographs of various locations you'll visit throughout the game. Union Stations, Bukane, Mount Itoi, Nintendo's house, and even Queen Mary's castle. You can also find a real-life picture of Mayor Goodman, this guy, and some random alcoholic. It's speculated that this individual is actually the same lady that offers Nintendo an alcoholic beverage at the lighthouse. Yes, that actually happens in this game. You're so cute. Oh, your name is Nintendo? Here, this beer's on me. Drink up. Oh, whoa, whoa, what the- There's a cop in here! Hey, you're underage. I'm taking you into custody. Whoa! <laughs> Are you kidding me? Is this actually happening? Wow. That- this is happening. This is happening right now. Nintendo, everybody. I get that these images come from real-life locations of our world, but this is something that you wouldn't normally see from other Nintendo properties. Through this method, it attempts to make the world of Mother feel more believable to our senses, and that's something I can respect. I mean, the game already takes place in modern times, so putting a bunch of photographs together and slapping town names on them is really no-brainer. Actors in 1989 commercial are unknown. The kids that portray Nintendo Anna and Lloyd in the 1989 commercial have been unidentified for the last 30 years. Though at this point they're all probably adults, it would at least be interesting to see what they've been up to all this time. There isn't much else to say here, but I hope that one day we find out something about these guys before another 30 years goes by. Watano Lemon Tea There are quite a few mother animations online, some of which you've already briefly seen in this video. Go support the original creators. But none are as plentiful as the ones that come from Watano Lemon Tea, a Japanese artist and animator. She currently has seven Mother 1 animations in total on her YouTube channel, with each one taking place throughout various parts from the game. She also makes some other mother related related animations, so go check those out. Earthbound Beginnings Randomizer Straight off the bat, this is probably my most favorite topic on this list, and it should be yours too, because this thing is just so criminally underrated. The Earthbound Beginnings Randomizer is a program that allows you to arbitrarily swap around item names, character sprites, enemy sprites, text, and more. It creates a very different experience of Earthbound Beginnings that not only increases replay value, but also could lead up to something pretty hilarious as a result. For example, here are some random scenarios I went through while playing as Gary here. Firstly, I fought a robot lamp, not a regular lamp, a robot lamp, which I think makes a difference. Then I encountered a spy bug who uses PSI, a groovy pile, and I saw some naked guy running around town. So, you know, pretty normal mother experience thus far. The randomizer also has something called monkey mode, which allows you to change your character sprites into, well, monkeys. Man, I know that's something Etoy would like. If you want to replay Earthbound Beginnings, but also want a fresh new take on it, I highly recommend at least trying this, even if the fun doesn't stay for very long. Game Boy Camera Ending Long after starting the handheld Game & Watch series, Nintendo was ready to move on to bigger and better things, or in this case, smaller and greener things. The Game Boy was not just the talk of the town, mind you, but the talk of the entire entire world as it single-handedly kickstarted a new era of portable gaming, not just for Nintendo, but for its various competitors at the time. This success would spawn all sorts of gimmicky accessories, including, but not limited to, the Game Boy Camera, a camera peripheral that you can attach to your Game Boy. Didn't see that coming. So you're probably asking me, what does this have to do with Mother? Well, I'll just play the credit sequence of the Game Boy Camera and let you figure it out. Listen carefully. That's right, out of all of the songs the Game Boy Camera could have ended with, they chose the Twinkle Elementary School theme for Mother, a game that is completely unrelated to this portable peripheral in every sense of the word. However, there are some differences between the two songs, so definitely give them both a listen whenever you feel up to the challenge. 
Hello, I really hope that you're enjoying this video so far. I will say from this point onward, we're going to start getting into some spoiler territory. I won't really be talking about Mother 3 for those of you who are wondering, but I will be spoiling the endings for both Mother 1 and 2. So if you haven't played through both of those games or just don't want to know how they end quite yet, well, I don't know you personally, so then I suggest clicking off this video so you can go and do so. On the other hand, if you don't really care for playing RPGs, then that's fine too. Go watch someone play through them for you, because that's what YouTube is all about. Or if you just want to keep watching my video and don't really care about what I'm saying, then stick around. There's still a lot to talk about. Mother Cognitive Dissonance. Look, okay, I know that it says Mother CD on the chart, but I didn't have enough room, so get off of my back! Don't worry, Mother Cognitive Dissonance is not another remake. We already crossed that bridge, and there won't be any more on this chart. Yay. Anyway, Mother Cognitive Dissonance is a popular Earthbound fan game created using RPG Maker. Speaking of popularity, the game is so well recognized by the Mother community that it even has its own tab on the Mother Forever website, another Mother fan site I forgot to mention earlier. But this isn't some ordinary Earthbound fan game, mind you. Unlike your typical Mother game, which usually takes place on Earth, Mother Cognitive Dissonance takes place in the far reaches of outer space. And instead of playing as as a psychic 12 year old boy with an act for baseball, here you play as Alan Navar, a wholesome little alien of the Mook species who likes to paint and play guitar for some reason. After being defeated by Ninten and his friends at the end of Mother 1, the main antagonist of the first two Mother games, Gaigu, or Gaigus, whichever you prefer, doesn't take his defeat too well and starts to slowly descend into madness from there on. It was at this time that Alan Navar realized how much of a danger Gaigu opposed to the universe around him and was tasked by a mysterious voice to stop his increase in power at all costs. Along the way, he meets other like minded aliens who join him on his adventure and they have a grand old time together. What makes Mother Cognitive Dissonance stand out among the already vast sea of Mother fan games is that it acts as a bridge between the events of Mother 1 and Mother 2, giving us a deeper look into Gaigu's relationship with Georgia Maria and how it all transpired into him becoming the universal cosmic destroyer that we see in Earthbound. Adding Anna and Teddy is optional. Along your adventure to save the world, you meet the following characters in order, Lloyd, Anna, then Teddy. But the only character that you really need for certain parts of the game is Lloyd since he is the only one that can fix the broken boat motor on Mount Etoy, which you have to do in order to find the seventh melody. You'll also need him to destroy the boulder north of Marysville in order to unlock the upper section of the map, which is where Mount Etoy is located. As for Anna and Teddy, the game doesn't require you to go through their storylines to beat the game. Heck, you don't even have to go into the towns they live in. Which brings up something else. Though this can both be considered a blessing and a curse, a really cool thing about Earthbound Beginnings is that you can go through certain parts of the game out of order if you wanted to. For example, I could go all the way to the live house, get Teddy, then come back to the Rosemary Manor to get the fifth melody. This is something that I love about this game, since it gives the player a variety of routes to choose from, a luxury that's not present in the other games. This is also likely due to the NES's hardware limitations, which is understandable, but the fact that you can play certain parts of the game out of order also grants you the ability to complete the game with different party member combinations. As intended, you're supposed to beat the game with just Ninten, Anna, and Lloyd. But, in a different scenario, you can also beat the game with just Ninten and Anna, or you can beat the game with just Ninten, Anna, and Teddy. It's even possible to beat the game by yourself if you wanted to. However, in order to achieve any of these methods, you'll need to jump through several hoops, but no worries, there are plenty of step-by-step -step guides online that'll walk you through the process. Teddy dies in the original release. Ho <laughs> ho, this is a dark one. So you might not know this, but Earthbound Beginnings and the original release of Mother 1 both end very differently. After defeating Gaigu in Earthbound Beginnings, you're treated to a very fulfilling conclusion, with you and your friends rescuing all of the captured humans, Teddy making a full recovery after almost dying, Lloyd finally proving himself among his peers, Anna becoming your new pen pal, and of course, bed. But in the ending of the original Japanese version, after defeating Gaigu, Ninten, Anna, and Lloyd will slowly turn themselves around to face you and continue to stare at you. Wait, what? That's how it ends? I wish I was kidding, but no, that's how it ends. You did it. Here's a stale skittle for you to break your teeth on. Congratulations. I'm not even trying to make this sound like a creepy pasta. That's just how it is. In its defense, however, Conch prefers this ending because of its suspense, and it really makes you use your imagination on what happens after this. Despite this, the ending was updated in the Mother 1 Plus 2 version of the game, but Japanese fans would still have to wait another 13 years to really see that happen. Anyway, so let's get back on topic here. Because of this ambiguous ending, many fans have concluded that Teddy, after fighting our 7038 passed away after failing to recover from his critical injuries. However, there is one hint that reassures us of his well-being, if you can call it much of a hint. After checking him, it's revealed that he is still breathing, but very softly, potentially lending us the notion that he's just fine, but you can take that as you will, since the Mother series is already chock full of ambiguity anyways. 
Alright, well, looks like we made it to the final tier. I will warn you though, that this is the most compact tier on this list, so brace yourselves. Are you ready? Here we go. Kui Fan Weed. If you're not keeping tabs on your local pie-headed teenager, then for all we know, they could be spending way too much time in the hacks editor making this. It's certainly not the weirdest ROM hack I've ever seen, but it's definitely pretty up there, and for more reasons aside from, well, the obvious. Kui Fan Weed is a ROM hack of Earthbound Beginnings that is also the perfect example of what the fuck am I reading. The text can be pretty incoherent, but from what I can gather, the game takes place in Brazil, where you play as Ronaldo or Kui, I don't know, this game is all over the place. Nintendo's character sprite also looks messed up for some reason, and there are a lot of references to soccer or football, as it's mentioned in the game. An interesting fact about this ROM hack, according to ROMhacking.net, is that it was uploaded all the way back on January 28th, 1999, only one year after the Demiforce hack was created. Unless I'm mistaken, this means Kui Found Weed is the second oldest ROM hack in Earthbound Beginnings history, and of all things that it could have been about, <laughs> it's about marijuana, so take that as you will. My biggest question at the moment is, who is Kui, why is this the only thing that he's ever made according to his account, and most importantly, why did he make it? That is an Earthbound Beginnings mystery we may never know. Cut Dungeon. When Mother 1 was being localized for North America, the localization team decided that some locations in the game had to be downsized. This was done in order to make navigating through them a little easier, as they believed these locations were too complicated for Western players. Because, you know, us big dumb cowboys can't do things for ourselves, unfortunately. Jokes aside, I really do appreciate these changes, especially for places like the Crystal Cavern, since this is a place you're going to be visiting a lot throughout the game. Other such changes include the town of Spookane, which didn't really need it, honestly, and the path leading into Mount Itoi. Teddy's Iguana. Teddy is a pretty unique character, not only because he's the only adult on the team, but also because he apparently owns a pet iguana, which is never mentioned throughout the game whatsoever. This tidbit about Teddy comes from a section of the Mother Encyclopedia, which gives us a much broader background on each of our four main heroes that the game otherwise wouldn't mention. Their likes, their dislikes, their taste in music, their favorite possessions, including but not limited to toys, instruments, glasses, baseball tickets, cigarettes, bent spoons, and all kinds of other wacky stuff. Stand by me reference. As we've seen a little bit thus far, the Mother series is not shy about referencing other material, especially if it's music related. <laughs> the Beatles. I mean, there is a whole one hour and 43 minute long iceberg video solely based on the music of the series, so if that's something of your interest, I encourage you to check it out. However, this particular reference we're about to discuss is more film related than music related. A resident in the town of Reindeer will tell you, and I quote, one time when I was little, I walked through the tunnel. I went to see a dead body. This line is a direct reference to the 1986 film Stand By Me, a film that is among Mother One's repertoire of various inspirations. While we're still on the topic of references, I might as well also bring up a few others. There is a high probability that the Rosemary Manor, the haunted house of the game, because you know, every Nintendo franchise has to have one, was named after the popular horror novel Rosemary's Baby. I'm not entirely sure if this has been confirmed or not, but it feels very intentional. This next reference was found in the Mother Encyclopedia. According to the text, some of Nintendo's female classmates say that he looks just like Luke Skywalker from the Star Wars franchise. Ninten himself, however, rebuttals this, being more of a Han Solo type of guy. What? Keep in mind that these are just a fraction of the references you'll find in this book, so I implore you to check it out for yourselves. Or not. I don't know. I'm not your mother. <laughs> He said it! He said it! The novel is told through Anna's perspective. Unlike the game, which starts you off as Ninten in the town of Podunk, the novel actually begins with Anna before the moment Ninten and Lloyd arrive to bring back her lost hat. This scene, by the way, happens more than halfway through the game, so the novel skips over a bunch of stuff. Though oddly enough, I'm fine with this, since we are given a glimpse of everything that happens up until that point through Anna's psychic visions, which is just enough to suffice. Anyway, we get to learn a lot about Anna seeing the world through her eyes. For example, we learn that Anna has a strong distaste for rock music due to her Christian upbringing, but she eventually comes full circle after attending a concert at the Live House. Another charming fact that we learn about Anna is that she has never seen the ocean in person before, at least not prior to the group visiting the town of LA. This is because she has been sheltered in her hometown all of her life, surrounded by nothing but snow and people sneezing on you. 
I have to say, Anna is a fun character to read through in this book, so I'll say it again, not upset by this change. Time Machine. Remember that guy that sells you a real rocket ship in Marysville? Well, yeah, we're going back to that guy again. But not for the same reason. In the Japanese version, you can buy a time machine from him for about 2,775 in-game dollars. He then, in a comedic fashion, as he does, accidentally pushes one of the switches and brings you back to the time where Nintendo and Lloyd made a mess of the science lab back when they first met. For whatever reason, this item was completely removed in Earthbound Beginning and instead replaced with a super bomb, most likely due to having more practical usage. One item that went completely unused in all versions of the game, however, was an item called an IC chip, which according to the game's data was an item that could only be used by Lloyd. Though it's unconfirmed, many assume that this item is related to the memory chip, which is a Mother 1 Plus 2 exclusive item that can be used to teleport to Eve's remains, in the same vein of how you can use the Onyx hook to teleport to Magicant. Etoy's Hidden Message So I will respect Etoy's wishes by not disclosing the location of this message, but I will will say this much, Etoy himself deliberately hid a secret message in the game for players to find, so if you just so happen to miss this on your first playthrough, here's another reason to go back and play it. Have fun! ESP1 Remember when I was talking about Mother 1's various titles in the beginning of this video? Well, there are actually a few more that I purposely didn't mention up until this point. Therefore, I introduce to you ESP1, which was basically the title given to the game prior to Mother. However, this name was only meant to act as a placeholder to Mother. In other words, it was not meant to stay for very long. While working on the game's English localization, there was another name aside from Earthbound that was considered, this title being Spacebound. But since the game, well, never mm -hmm. takes place, in space, the title just seemed misleading if anything. However, Phil Sandhop did hope that Spacebound would make a return for the game's sequel, Earthbound being the first game and Spacebound being the second game. If we're following this same pattern, then what do you think Mother 3 would be called? Universe Bound or Galaxy Bound? Ooh, Galaxy Bound. Now that sounds kind of sexy. I'm not even kidding when I say that what I just said is exactly what Steve Demeter said about the Earthbound Zero title. It's hysterical. Go watch the Mother to Earth documentary if you haven't already. One final name that was given to the game and the series in general was Earth Adventure, which is a title that is seen exclusively in China and Taiwan. It definitely doesn't roll off the tongue like Earthbound, but at the very least it's not something too deceptive like Spacebound, so that works. Can we decide what's going on? I'm looking at this loose script and I have no idea where we are. I almost didn't even hear about this one before working on this iceberg chart. So during the prime days of Starman.net, there existed Radio PSI, an ongoing interactive online radio show where you can request songs, play games, and talk to the DJs who were running the whole thing. But that wasn't all Radio PSI had to offer to Mother fans. A group of five legendary mother-loving landlubbers created Fobbies of Borange, which is a popular radio play of Earthbound or Mother 2 that was performed live on the station from 2007 to 2008. If you're unfamiliar with what a radio play is, think of a theatrical play, but minus the visuals and up the imagination. That's what a radio play is. According to the Fobbies of Borange website, it's considered to be one of the greatest video game fan work endeavors of all time and would reach a momentum of popularity that would eventually kickstart various spin-off series. Likewise, a radio play of Earthbound Beginnings was born, titled Lloyd's Are Not Christmas. As you can tell just by the name, the show is above all things a parody and never really takes itself too seriously. What makes Lloyd's Are Not Christmas stand out, however, was its heavy reliance on improv, unlike Fobbies of Borange, which had an established script every episode. For better or for worse, this would lead to a lot of confusion, which was especially the case for the leading role of Ninten, Stephen George, who had no idea what was happening pretty much the entire time, and the fact that he only played a sliver of the game the show is based on, it certainly didn't help his situation. Despite this, one thing that did come of Stephen while being a part of Lloyd's or Not Christmas was the awakening of his iconic voice for Ninten. Take a listen. I'm wandering around aimlessly. All right, let's see. Oh, look, Grandfather's Journal. That, that sound means I got it. Why are you so blue, Panda Bear? That's because my uncle lives here and he peed on everything, probably. It's so freaking annoying. I wish I had a gun. My God. Did anyone notice that the word spookane has poo in it? Anna, stop looking at me. Do not lust after the flesh. Other such voices include Jamie Carignan as Lloyd, Jane Tovar as Anna, and Muhammad Abdul Rahim as Teddy. You might remember me mentioning Kaj, who helped me do some research on this tier. He personally grew up listening to these radio plays and highly recommended recommends them. Though that might be just as nostalgia talking, either or, check it out for yourselves. Nintendo plays Minecraft. Once Lloyd's or Not Christmas officially ended, everyone continued to move on with their lives. 
But Stephen George wasn't ready to give up on his golden child Nintendo boy so quickly, as he had other projects in mind. Introducing Nintendo Speaks, a show of his own creation where, as Nintendo, he talks about pretty much anything. Complaints against complicated math equations, why robots shouldn't be making cereal, the importance of why you shouldn't drop babies. It's quite a hoot, but it doesn't end there. Not long after this, he would start making Minecraft Let's Plays while, of course, staying in character. The story is that Nintendo somehow trapped himself within the Minecraft universe, so now it's up to him to survive in this new environment. Probably must have used the fourth D slip in his sleep or something. I, I don't know. I wonder if that's possible. Anyway, his Nintendo Plays Minecraft series would only go on for about 56 episodes, but even then, it doesn't end there. He would also take his Nintendo alter ego to McDonald's and would even make a literal Nintendo Christmas album. White Christmas, you know what? These lyrics are kind of boring and it's really slow. Why did I agree to do this song? I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. Now here I am talking about all of the various things he's done as Nintendo when I haven't even talked about the man behind the mask. Stephen George is a popular figure in the mother community for working on all kinds of weird, wacky, earthbound related projects. Aside from this, he also has his own vlog channel and Let's Play channel respectively. And guess what? On his Let's Play channel, he would finally complete playing through Mother 1 after all of those years, which is a perfect way to wrap up this topic and move on. Ninten is an asshole in the novel. When it comes to the original game, it isn't easy to pinpoint Ninten's overall personality since he's mostly a silent protagonist in the same vein as Mario or Link. Despite this, the Mother Encyclopedia describes Ninten's personality in a very positive light. He's energetic, a natural born leader, and is seemingly a role model among his classmates. Even in the game, one thing that we see Ninten do a lot of is being an altruist. So overall, Ninten is a pretty good kid, right? Well, you might be surprised that in the novel he is a completely different person, often being described as immature, apathetic, and cold. Even when Pippi gifted him the Franklin badge at the beginning of the book, he didn't think much of it. Not to mention that he also belittles his friends from time to time, which is... Okay. No, Ness. That's not okay. That's never okay. See, this is what I meant when referring to the novel as an alternate universe apart from the game. Not only is Ken's personality different from Nintendo's, but also his appearance. According to the book, Ken has blonde hair, blue eyes, and wears an army jacket with all sorts of emblems on it. At first I didn't really like this new look, but it eventually grew on me, maybe even more than Nintendo's original design. Although I can never hate that design, that would just be uncouth of me. If you think about it, Ken feels kind of like a nice blend between Ness and Lucas, and maybe even a little bit of Bart Simpson, because, you know, Bart is just brats differently. Lloyd was planning to blow up the school. If Lloyd was a valley, then the only foliage that would grow in said valley would be a forest of red flags. I mean, this poor little guy gets picked on all of the time, even by his own dad. Combining that with the odd fascination for explosives, I mean, what more can I say? This boy's got some problems, we know that much. So what if the explosion that ruined the science lab was no accident? Hmm. Well, obviously it was an accident. This is just fan speculation, nothing more. But it is quite dark nonetheless. Like, holy crap, let's get off this subject. Breadcrumbs glitch. Breadcrumbs are a super handy feature in this game. If you ever have bread stored in your inventory, instead of eating it, you can create a trail of breadcrumbs as a means to fast travel back to wherever you started the trail. Given how gargantuan the map is for this game, this feature is certainly a necessity of life, especially when your party are in the midst of danger. There is a game-breaking glitch that you can do with these in order to skip large portions of the game, and speedrunners use it all the time. The catch is, there are a couple ways to do it. The simplest way is to first have Pippi in your party. If Pippi herself starts a breadcrumb trail that gets removed from the party after returning her to the mayor, then she will keep the crumbs in her inventory. You can then retrieve the crumbs back from her by going to her house and talking to her, but since she was removed from the party, the breadcrumb trail she set earlier would reset. So if you decided to follow her breadcrumb trail, it will teleport you to, from what I can understand, to be Mother Purgatory, a monochrome playset of Reach home to a bunch of jumbled up assets from the game, as well as a lot of grass. Interacting with some of these jumbled up assets will actually bring you to the locations where those assets belong. Again, great for speedrunning. If you're getting all excited and ready to use this for yourself, then allow me to destroy your spirits by saying this glitch was completely patched in the American release. Sandhop, you and your team have done many great things for this game, but this is the one thing that you really could have left alone. Z Sukubi. Speaking of Mother 1 speedrunning, according to speedrun.com, Z Sukubi is the number one best speedrunner of Mother 1, both with and without using the infamous breadcrumb glitch we just talked about. He is also among the top three best speedrunners without the use of any random number generator manipulation, which is an entirely different topic that I don't care to explain, not because I don't know it, but because it's so boring. If you want to learn more about it, go check out this tech rules video. As for Z 
Zakubi, he has a Twitch channel where he records his speedruns, so if that's your cup of tea, drink that shit. The Tigers, the world is waiting for us. Mother 1's interactivity with the player, as well as the game's final boss fight, was heavily influenced by the 1968 film, The Tigers, the world is waiting for us. There was a scene in the movie where Julie, the lead of the Tigers band, encouraged the audience to help them defeat the opposing aliens through the power of singing. Sound familiar? Well, it should, since that is exactly how you defeat Gaigu in Mother 1, which isn't just any song, but a lullaby that Maria once sung to Gaigu as a baby. A similar boss fight would occur in the finale for Mother 2, which would also, just like the first game, prioritize over nonviolent methods to defeat him. One last thing I'd like to mention is that there are a few moments where the game directly addresses you, the player, which is a concept that also pays homage to the film. This interactivity with the player creates a more immersive experience as if you were one of the main fighting forces, helping these kids get through their journey safely. So when you finally see that mothership retreat back into the stratosphere, it feels no different than a janitor mopping a movie set, but still gets put in the credits anyways. However else you feel about it, it doesn't really matter. Mother 1 Manga There's a lot of mother manga out there, but the most difficult part about their existence is keeping track of all of them, just like running a preschool. Luckily, Starman.net has a comprehensive list of them, but still, much of their content has yet to surface online since they're pretty underground even for Mother 1 standards. Therefore, I will only be focusing on the forerunner of this topic, that being Believe and Boy Meets Girl, written by mangaka Tashio Rekishi. Believe was first issued in 2002 and mainly focuses on Lloyd's whereabouts during Nintendo and Teddy's ascension up towards Mount Itoi. This issue is solely focused on Lloyd and his character growth throughout this short period of time and presents to us a side of Mother 1's narrative that we never got to see in the game. Rikishi's other manga, Boy Meets Girl, was first issued in 2001 and is about Nintendo and Lloyd first meeting Anna and Snowman. Both of these mangas were completely scanned by Satsi and unofficially translated by none other than Kanesu 3000. Hey, we know that guy! And we'll see him again in... Yasu Nikoben. Getting all of the mother games into English was a bit of a long journey, and is still considered by many to be one that is ongoing. Articles are made about it, artwork was made about it, documentaries were made about it, and so on. But unfortunately, my friend, that's not even the half of it, as beneath our noses lies a much obscure rabbit hole. Like I said before, the Mother 1 novel was never officially translated into English, which left a lot of room for fans to make their own translation. I know what you're thinking, it's Mother 3 all over again, hooray. Short summaries of the book were conjured up by Kenesu 3000, Tomato, and many others, but for the longest time, there was never a complete translation, which they aspired to make but either struggled doing so or just never did. Then all of a sudden, the tectonic plates shifted when Nyasu Nikoben, a fellow artist and translator, uploaded this post to their Twitter account. She not only translated the Mother 1 novel in its entirety, but the Mother 2 novel as well. This all dropped about a year ago too, so spread the word and check out the books. Also, rest in peace little Munchie, my condolences. Likeness to Frankie from One Piece. In the popular anime and manga series One Piece, there is a character named Frankie who looks a lot like Teddy. The chin, the hair, the personality, especially the glasses, they're all remarkably similar to Teddy's and very well could have been inspired by Teddy. But in case I haven't convinced you, listen to this. Frankie makes his first appearance in a place called the Frankie House. House, which sounds eerily similar to the live house where Teddy makes his first appearance in Mother. But in case I still haven't convinced you, there is a boss in Mother 2 that is literally named Frankie, who is often compared to Teddy by fans. But the true inspiration behind Frankie, at least according to the manga cub, One Piece was from watching Jim Carrey's performance in the film series Ace Ventura. So maybe all of this is just a ruse of mine, I'm not sure. Gintama reference. In the 2003 anime and manga series Gintama, there is a scene where the protagonists are making a poster trying to advertise something. They end up deciding to copy Mother 1's official poster to help them market the game in Japan as a base for their idea. They also make a joke about Itoi having big nostrils. Jesus! Certain victory guy. If a Nintendo character was being chased by zombies, what do you think they'd say? Great oogity boogity, watch out for the zombies. Oh darn, here come the zombies. How about Jesus? <laughs> Well, that's exactly what we see in an illustration of Ninten running from a synchronized pack of the undead. And understandably so. The Certain Victory Guide itself, where the image originates from, is a Japan-only video game strategy guide, and much like this image, there were other official publications from Nintendo with characters throwing out obscenities, much like the time where Kirby said shit, or where Mario said shit, or where Diddy Kong said shit. Yep, all of these are real. Why do haters hate 8-bit philosophy? Now, I found this video purely on accident only a couple years ago, just by looking around some wisecrack playlists. Allow me to give you some backstory. At my local college, I took part in a philosophy class where we would often watch videos made by Wisecrack, which is a popular YouTube channel that specializes in critical analysis of various forms of media, and of course, teaching philosophical ideas. They go about this in all sorts of ways, even creating a series of videos using 8-bit video games as a visual tool titled 8-bit 
conservative philosophy. In Season 1, Episode 23 of this series, they explained the ideas of controversial philosopher Diogenes the Cynic, and out of all of the games they could have used for this video, they chose Earthbound Beginnings. When I first saw this, it felt like I just happened to meet an old friend of mine at McDonald's or something. It was bizarre. But what's really bizarre is that the game's official release on the Wii U Virtual Console would happen only five months after this video was uploaded. Could this be possible foreshadowing? Who knows, but it would make for a good wisecrack video. Early Prototype Footage It's easy to tell from this footage of Mother 1's development that a lot of changes were made to the final product, including sprite placements, map designs, enemy pairings, and other more minor changes like how there used to be grass in Mount Itoi and how there used to be a train track splitting between the town of Snowman. At least I think it's Snowman. The enemy designs are about the same, but as I briefly mentioned, the enemies seen in this footage are paired together in ways that you don't normally see in the final game. Also, Nintendo and his friends walk down the stairs diagonally for some reason, and there is a really small piece of the Mother logo that is clipped off at the right bottom corner of the screen if you pay close attention. I barely noticed this at first, which is something you're probably going to say to yourself a lot if you watch this more than once. Mother Toy Theater Production Tyler Banadaga, a fellow YouTuber and musician, created a 1 hour and 47 minute long stage play of Mother 1 using cardboard and paper cutouts to retell the story. It's honestly super impressive. The amount of effort that went into making this must have been back aching. Like someone had to have handmade all of these backgrounds, props, and characters, not to mention the music, which fits this style of storytelling quite nicely. Though it's not an exact retelling of the game, it's more of a retelling of the game mixed with the novel, along with some artistic liberties. For example, the play starts off with Anna and Snowman, much like in the novel, but Ninten is not named Ken in this play, nor does he look like him, but he does still act like him. Maybe we should listen to our Ninten. Who's leading this group? It was my great grandpa who's tied to all this crazy stuff. I'm the one who left home on his own. Neither of you knew what to do till I showed up to save you. Don't forget that I found you hiding out in a garbage can behind your school, Lloyd. Now I've got this girl along who somehow figures she can just take over. There are also some events that occur in this play that don't happen in either the novel or the game, so it's its own unique experience that's really worth tackling, especially considering how underground it is, even among the mother community. As of writing this, the movie only has 965 views, which is super unfortunate because this should be worth so much more than that. Do me a favor and go check out this guy's channel whenever you're not too busy fighting your local possessed lamp or naked doll thing. Keep Eve Glitch Much like Pippi or even Teddy, Eve is also a very temporary addition to your party, though it doesn't have to stay that way. We all know what happens. You encounter R7038XX, there is a huge robot battle, Eve defeats him but is also fatally wounded herself, and within her remains you find the seventh melody, at least that's how it's supposed to go. However, through executing this pretty simple glitch, you can keep Eve in your party all the way up to the game's grand finale. But before I explain how this glitch works, I first must explain a weird fact about Mother 1's code. Battle sequences in this game typically don't last for very long, but if you manage to stay in battle for up to 255 turns, the battle will just end. That's it. <laughs> So with that in mind, while you're fighting R7038XX, you can use this item called a flea bag that will greatly reduce any enemy's offense and defense. Therefore, he is no longer strong enough to defeat Eve like he's supposed to. Furthermore, 255 turns later, you win the battle and Eve still remains in your party. It's pretty cool and all, but unfortunately, just like the breadcrumb glitch, this one was also completely patched in the English version. Red Rocket. Oh no, we made it to this one. So because of Red Rocket's explicit content, I'm going to be light on the D details, but I will say this much. Red Rocket is a ROM hack of Earthbound Beginnings that was created in 2009 by Coco. No, not the ape. Not that ape either. That's not even... Whatever. This ROM hack is very similar to Kui Fan Weed in its absurdity, but holds a very low bar in comparison due to it containing some not so nice things involving animals, as you could probably tell. However, what makes Red Rocket so interesting is more of its accessibility than its content, since trying to find a download for this thing is like trying to find a Bulbasaur in a greenhouse. We know very well that it exists, thanks to a couple of videos online, but at the time of recording this, there is currently no way to download and play Red Rocket, at least not that I know of. Unused Logo So did you know that Nintendo to actually submitted two logo designs for the game? Of course there's this one, which would become the logo's final design, but then there's this one, which is a little bit lesser known. Kinda reminds me of some of my old drawings. I think that it still gets its point across, you know, with the UFO and everything, but let me know in the comments section what you guys think. Yay or nay. Ninten Mannequin. You know, I've thought I've seen just about everything in this crazy community, but I guess not. When the Mother to Earth documentary was first making the rounds publicly, so too would a mannequin resembling Ninten, which I assume was made to help promote the film and its merchandise. Some people were understandably pretty creeped out by it, while others adored the shit out of it. So much, in fact, that the Mother to Earth team would drag this little boy wonder 
all across the country under the Twitter hashtag NintendoCrossAmerica. I suppose that might explain why he went missing that one time, but don't worry, just like in the game, Ninten tends to find a way to return back home wherever the hell he's coming from. PK Techno. Some of you guys have heard of it, others, no, not at all. Some of you might think at first glance, oh shit, is this a PSI power in Earthbound Beginnings that I somehow missed getting? Because it sounds so much like a genuine PSI power that it would exist in this game? Just to clear up some potential confusion, PK Techno was never an Earthbound beginning since this ability was made by a fan. It would gain a lot of interest across the internet, with fans making their own interpretations of how the power would work. But that still leaves many questions, like where did PK Techno come from, who created it, and why? With a tad of research and a bit of communication, I now hold the answers to those questions, and then some. PK Techno was created by none other than PSI Paula 4 herself. Yes, that same PSI Paula 4 we talked about in the last year. Since Ninten was the only mother protagonist that didn't have any offensive PSI moves like Ness or Lucas did, she decided to come up with one for him. I was 12, I just started getting into the Mother series, but I haven't played the games yet. From looking at Starman.net, I knew Lucas's PK Rockin' equivalent was PK Love, but I didn't find a signature move for Ninten that did damage, obviously because he doesn't have one. So I decided to make one up myself. I decided that PK Techno because 12 year old me thought that well, both rock and love are music genres. Is love really a music genre? Well, I guess that depends on who you ask. She continues to say, so maybe they're all named after music genres, and I picked techno because for some reason I thought that was the most popular genre in the 80s. Well, Mother One did come out near the end of that decade, so it seems fitting. In conclusion, PSI Paula 4, if you're watching this right now, I just wanted to tell you with my own voice, thank you so much for answering my questions and being a part of this. You've been a really big help. I really appreciate it. post credit scene mystery. As I mentioned earlier, Earthbound Beginnings has a more fleshed out ending than its Japanese counterpart, providing more substance to the aftermath of your adventure. But one thing that fans still scratch their heads over to this very day is what did Nintendo's father want to tell him over the payphone? He says quote unquote something new has come up but doesn't provide any more information than that and the game just ends there. The English localization team probably created the screen under the impression that Mother 2 would be a continuation of Nintendo's story, but since that didn't happen, we're just left with something pretty confusing. At the same time, it also gives us a taste of something that very well could have been. Remember Gaigu. Remember Gaigu is a 5 minute long animated short created by Haggis Led Dude, otherwise known as Haggis Guy. I'm so sorry if I butchered that by the way. The video is a drama, showing the strong relationship between Gaigu and Maria before it was eventually torn apart by George's actions. You can find a short teaser of this video on Hawkes Ledoux's YouTube channel, but the full video can only be found on Newgrounds. Not long after the video's release, it made the front page at the site and even received a daily second place award. Gaigu voice auditions. This is referring to a few voice performances for Gaigu on YouTube. Here's just a sample of one of them created by We Are Earthbound. Ninten, Ninten, I am grateful to your family, your family, your great grandparents, George, George, Maria, Maria, Maria.
Youngtown Subliminal Message While playing through Earthbound Beginnings, or Earthbound Zero as it was called then, a fan discovered an odd pattern with a certain patch of grass sprites in Youngtown, this pattern taking the form of three sixes, or 666. Similarly, there is a peace sign and infinity sign right outside of the Yuka Desert, which looks a little more intentional. But as for the 666 in Youngtown, I think this one is more of a coincidence of anything. Encyclopedia WTF Impact on other Nintendo properties. Since Mother isn't as recognized in America as it is in Japan, it's easy to miss how vast of an influence this game and its two sequels have had over Nintendo's other games, even playing a role in the creation of some of Nintendo's biggest cash cows. Let me ask you something. What is another Nintendo game, aside from Mother 1, where you can use an ocarina to play melodies? If you answered The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, then you are correct. What about going around town talking to NPCs as if they are real people, with a slight pinch of quirkiness? Animal Crossing anybody? What about a game where you literally play as a young boy wearing a red cap who travels across the world to fight all kinds of creatures. That's right, Pokemon. Yes, Pokemon, Nintendo's most lucrative IP. Even the design for Mewtwo takes after Gaigu, believe it or not. Of course, not every aspect of these games take direct influence from Mother, but you can definitely tell that some elements were borrowed and implemented in their own unique way. And I'm not even gonna start with non-Nintendo games, that's an entirely different lecture. Though if you are interested in learning more about it, I suggest checking out the Mother Forever website or even their YouTube channel, as they have conducted many interviews with game developers who were inspired by the series. I'll leave a link to the website in the description down below. One thing you should probably know about my friend Kaj is that he created a Mother 1 Iceberg chart of his own and was kind enough to share some of his work for the sake of this video. He is quite knowledgeable about the Mother series and even knew some things that I honestly completely missed out on. With that said, him and I were eager to work together and with our collaboration came the bonus tier. It contained some topics from his iceberg as well as a few new ones, so ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present to you five final topics as a farewell. Earthbound Beginnings Canadian Localization The year is 1994. Four years have now passed since the cancellation of Mother One's English Relative, and by this point, everyone has moved on from the project, including Etoy, who at this time would release the very game he is best known for here in the West. Meanwhile, Nintendo of Canada, who I completely forgot existed for a minute there, was interested in the possibility of making Earthbound Beginnings a Canadian exclusive on the NES. But unfortunately, they eventually decided against this, since they would have to make a Canadian French translation, and that would just be too much work. This is heartbreaking, I mean, Earthbound Beginnings already got rejected one. So the fact that it got rejected again but by Canada just makes me want to sing the blues and weep like a sorry sailor. Forgotten Man in Reindeer Town Now anybody in the Mother community will tell you that Reindeer Town is the most unnecessary town in the game, which they are partially right. You won't be able to find anything relevant to the plot here, but there are some weird interactions to be had, especially with this guy who you'll find hiding in a shroud of trees. When you talk to him, he'll say, I am a man whose existence does not matter. My importance is so small that I may not be missed should I disappear. Now this exact exact manner of speaking sounds identical to that of the Forgotten Man in the Crystal Caverns. But what's the say of this particular scenario, and how does it all connect together? Well that, I am not sure of. This mystery is very similar to the Spookane Mystery Girl in that there's really not that much to scratch at. So I'll simply just conclude by saying, it's really up to your interpretation. Unused Check Descriptions In total, there are two check descriptions that went completely unused in the game, the first one being with the possessed doll. Spooky! The doll walks by itself! 
This check description can be found in both Mother 1 and Earthbound Beginnings Code, but for some reason went completely unused. The last one is with your short swabble with Teddy at the live house. If you decided to check him during combat, his description would read as the following. Maybe he's not really rotten to the core, which says a lot about his character and I really wish they could have kept this in the game, but oh well, it's the thought that counts. There's one more interesting piece of text that went unused, but this one would have been related to talking rather than checking. This would have been used in the Cave of Trap Civilians. Instead of two, there are originally going to be three people that you can talk to in here. This unknown third person would have said, not that I have claustrophobia, but I can't stand small closed spaces. I wish I knew the reason why they didn't use this one because this sounds very earthbound like. Nintendo is still unplayable in Super Smash Brothers. If you have heard of the Mother series through the Super Smash Brothers games, then welcome to 90% of the population. In the first Smash game on the N64, there were only 12 playable fighters, and out of those 12 fighters, one of them was set to represent the Mother universe. Nintendo had to choose one over the other, and of course, as we all know, they chose Ness for this position. Eventually, Lucas, the protagonist of Mother 3, would also join the fray, but unfortunately for Nintendo, he still has yet to make his mark on the roster, even though he is the protagonist of the very first game that started the whole damn series. Perhaps this provides evidence that Etoy never intended Ness and Nintendo to be two separate characters from each other, which might explain their visual similarities and Nintendo's overall absence in the Smash games. But by that same token, the Smash series clearly acknowledges Nintendo as his own character, as we can see by these images. But when it comes down to it, he's still not playable, and we're still left to speculate among ourselves. So what are we left to do? Make mods, of course! Some fans in the Smash community have put together some really convincing mods to put Nintendo in the game, and they are super cool to look at. My favorite one being in Project M, where they give Nintendo his own moveset and everything. Earthbound Beginnings ranked number one bestseller on Wii U sales. It's time to take a rewind back to that special day. The day where Earthbound Beginnings finally officially released on the Wii U Virtual Console. Emphasis on officially, by the way, meaning that Nintendo actually released the game. 25 years later, talk about a surprise entrance. Now you might be delighted to hear that when Earthbound Beginnings came out, it hit the top of the recent sales chart, and not just in North America, but also in Europe. Even outselling the likes of Splatoon, which at the time was a brand new IP. It's really cool to finally see Earthbound Beginnings get some success after all of that time laying in Phil Sandhoff's desk drawer. All right, uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, we did an encyclopedia. WTF, that was like two weeks out the window. Uh, uh, hey, hello. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You can stop now. What? Yeah, you talked about everything. Oh, really? It's over? Yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah, neither can I, but get off the set. This is my show now. Well, this was certainly a journey, wasn't it? To give you an idea of how long I've been working on this thing, I started all the way back in mid-February, which was like, what, nine months ago? Man, I don't even want to think about it. To conclude this video, I have played a lot of great video games. Even Earthbound and Mother 3 are both very great games in their own way. But nothing has hit me quite like Earthbound Beginnings has. It's one of those rare works of fiction that really stick with you. Whether you love it or hate it or don't even know what it is, I hope at the very least that this video has given you some kind of appreciation for this game's bizarre existence and all of the things that have come of it. Thanks for watching.